Uh, okay, um, so it's a great pleasure to, uh, oops, it's going crazy. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak here at this nice conference and uh, I am actually giving two talks, one today and one tomorrow. And uh, I will start uh, with some background today and uh, try and explain where things came from and also uh, where there was progress over the last few years in, in open grammar witten theory. And, um, and these uh, will lead to a proof, sort of mathematical proof of this uh, large and duality for not conormals. And they, this, it's, it's very good to uh, have that proof, but it also indicates the way forwards where there will be a uh, geometric interpretation. So then I'm sort of going into talk two, where we'll have geometric interpretation of, uh, of recursion relations uh, for say Homfly polynomials or other open string partition functions. And, um, and, and it also gives us a way to actually carry out a lot of these calculations fairly easily by looking from infinity. And it also leads the way towards understanding um, or at least first steps towards understanding whatever would be the Grupa um version of, 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 for open strings. Um, so, but that, that's, that's way into the talk tomorrow. And I should also mention as written up there that this talk reports on uh, quite a few joint projects uh, with, with many co-authors. Um, you see some of them listed there. Okay, um, <clears throat> so to start the story, uh, the, the geometric setting um, will be that of a three-dimensional symplectic Calabriao manifold. So this three-dimensional means really six-dimensional. It's a real six-dimensional space, sort of complex three-dimensional. And it's symplectic, so it comes equipped with a non-degenerate two-form omega, which is also closed. So if you have such a space, then uh, the, you can equip it with a so-called almost complex structure, which is a complex structure on all its tangent spaces, um, which is compatible with this omega. And the, the choice of such complex structures is contractible choice. So it defines for us uh, churn classes of these manifold. And the Calabria condition is that the, the first churn class of the manifold is zero. And so, these, these are lots of words, but the spaces that we'll actually deal with during the talk uh, are well known. So it's, it's the complex coordinate space C3. We have the cotangent bundle of, of the three sphere, maybe of real projective three space. And then there is the resolved conifold and, and uh, local P1 times P1. So uh, these are fairly well known spaces. So, so nothing worse than that. And inside these spaces, we will have some uh, boundary conditions where, where our open strings will end, and then those will be Lagrangian submanifolds. And they will have uh, they will be required to have Maslow index zero. So this is a sort of relative version of this C1 is zero. So I'm not going to say terribly much about that, but 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 anyway, that's where they are. And again, they uh, they are well-known characters. So um, we have uh, toric brain in C3 and uh, maybe in, in the conifold. They're not conormal, so I'll discuss them. And also, of course, in the cotangent bundles, we have the zero section. So they're half-dimensional uh, spaces, these Lagrangians, and they have the property that the uh, symplectic form vanishes along them. So you, you should think about Rn in in CN or R3 in C3 in this talk. Okay, so that, that's somehow the ambient space um, and boundary condition setting and main characters during the entire talk are holomorphic curves. So if we now have one of these almost complex structures on, on our space, um, then a holomorphic curve is a map from a Riemann surface uh, into the space that solves the cauchy riemann equation. So the cauchy riemann equation is written down there, but it really means that the, uh, that the uh, differential of our map, which maps the 
two-dimensional tangent space of the Riemann surface into the six-dimensional tangent space of our target manifold is complex linear. So it, it, it commutes uh, with uh, the complex structure on the surface and in, in, the, in the space. So, so what's written there is the fact that the complex antilinear part of the differential is equal to zero. Okay, so this is, a, the, this is a partial differential equation and it's a Fredholm operator. And uh, for such Fredholm operators, the index of the linearized operator then uh, gives the expected dimension of the moduli space. And by uh, basically riemann roch formula, uh, this in this case is given by the complex dimension of X minus three times the only characteristic of the, of the Riemann surface, plus uh, twice a certain relative churn class of the pullback of the tangent bound. So basically you, well, uh, you try to trivialize it and it comes up so something over the boundary and, and that, that's this, this relative churn class. In our case, uh, the three dimensional condition uh, is saying that the first term drops out in this formula. So that's zero. And the Calabi-Yau plus Maslow zero condition says that the second term in this formula is zero. So we're in this super nice situation where all holomorphic curves that you ever see, if you perturb a little bit, they should come in zero dimensional families. So it should just be like a zero manifold or possibly a zero manifold with rational weights because they're orbifold phenomena, but somehow everything uh, generically should be rigid. So, so that's why we have counting problems from math point of view. Okay, but, but so at this point, the only thing I want to do is to sort of set the stage. So we have ambient space, we have boundary condition, and we have these holomorphic curves, uh, which, which we should remember are maps of Riemann surfaces satisfying certain differential equations. So the next thing I want to go over also quickly is, is uh, this sort of called a model topological string on X, so just mainly to show that there is a somehow physical theory, topological string theory behind uh, all of these holomorphic curves that I will talk about. And, uh, and, and what that theory is, uh, is, is a theory of maps uh, into the, uh, somehow it's, it's like com configuration space of holomorphic curve. So it, it's a theory that lives over all maps of, of Riemann surfaces into our space. And, and you see this phi here is such a map, uh, but along that map, we also throw in some super partners. So it's a sort of super symmetric theory so the, the coordinates of, of the map has uh, vector field uh, super friends and, and, and the differential has uh, uh, other fields which are sections in, in the bundle stated there. And then we have a Lagrangian, which in some sense is the supersymmetric extension of the Dirichlet energy. Um, and, and I'm not gonna say very much about that, but this is what the theory looks like. And, and that, theory has the property, and that's somehow the starting point for all this gromer witten theory, that the path integral that initially is defined over a very big space, namely the space of all maps of Riemann surfaces and so on into this space, actually localizes on, on the holomorphic maps. And the holomorphic maps uh, form finite dimensional manifolds or orbifolds, but in fact, after, after uh, perturbation, as we were, were saw, as we saw that the expected dimension is zero, so the whole path integral reduces to a to an integral over a finite dimensional space, namely the moduli space of holomorphic curves. And in this Calabi-Yau case, for generic data, when when you perturbed everything out, uh, in fact, that finite dimensional space is zero dimensional, and so the the integral is just a, a sum. And, uh, and, and, and the, that sum or the count of such curves is called the gromer witten partition function if, if we exponentiate it. So here I'm, I'm writing it uh, in, in, a, in a sort of little bit specific way. So inside this sum here, you have, you, you fix the genus and you fix the number of boundary components or holes in the surface. 
And then the contribution would be this sort of string coupling constant that keeps track of the genus. So it's, it's raised to the only characteristic or the negative of the only characteristic of the domain. And then there is this N. So uh, N was the number of copies of the Lagrangian we took here. And basically the idea with this N to, to number of boundary components is that for each boundary component, you can choose which one of the Lagrangians that the, the stack of Lagrangians, which it ends on, so that multiplies the number of curves by this n to the h. And finally, there is this uh, uh, fgh, which is some numbers. In simplest case, it's just a number, number of curves uh, with that genus and that number of holes. But you can also put other things in this fgh. We will see it very soon. Namely, you can encode the homology class of the curve and so on. So th this is some kind of little bit souped up number, but bas basically homology class and number of holes. Okay, so, so this is what the gromer witten theory uh, would be, uh, you know, uh, or, or coming from topological string on X. So, so somehow you set up some theory, you have a path integral over infinite dimensional space. It localizes on this finite dimensional space of Holomorphic curves, which in fact, in some sense, just zero dimensional, and you get the count. Okay, uh, from from the mathematical point of view, uh, we uh, you cannot quite start with this path integral. So there there is not very much of an off shell off shell uh, formulation of the theory. Rather, one would just start from the from the uh, moduli space of holomorphic curves. So you have your three manifold or six manifold X, you pick a, an almost complex structure and you try to uh, look at the space of holomorphic curves. You hope it's zero dimensional and you sum up, you sum up all the curves. So here I, I I'm so sorry, N is wrong here in the left-hand side, it should be X. Um, but, but anyway, so here I'm moving now to the closed curve case. So there is no Lagrangian, I'm just counting maps of Riemann surfaces that happen to be holomorphic and form a zero manifold. So uh, th this, this uh, statement that we can perturb so it's zero dimensional is a, is a rather big statement. It's not so easy to create such perturbation schemes. Uh, by now, there are a few uh, ways of doing that. And in this setup, there has been many ways uh, since the early days of this theory to do so. Um, but, but nevertheless, uh, what I want to say is not completely trivial story, and it's uh, we, we will we will come back to that story in the case of curves with boundary a little bit. Um, and here, somehow, the exponentiation in the right hand side is somehow an indication that we are counting not connected curves but all disconnected curves. Okay, um, but what will be important here and important later is that, okay, so so what we said was we have this almost complex structure, we perturb the equation somehow, and once that perturbation has been designed, we have a zero manifold, we count things up, and that's some kind of Roman with a number, let's say. Um, but we would like to see that this is actually invariant, so it doesn't depend on choice of almost complex structure, choice of perturbation, and so on. And from the physical point of view, that's uh, more or less an effect of this action being Q exact. So, so, so when you vary the data a little bit, it somehow changes by exact form uh, on, on this moduli space and it doesn't change the integral. But here uh, we don't have this big time off shell formulation. So, so we have to invent some more by hands proof to start from the moduli space itself the zero manifold and then see what happens when we deform things. And, and the key point is that for, for closed Gromwitten uh, theory, the nodal curves, the non-smooth non curves or somehow non, um, what to say, wh where this manifold is, is not um, a transversely cut out counter curves, it's actually happening in co-dimension two. So we can go around such, such instances and then the count doesn't change very much. So here 
is an illustration of that. So we have some here, down here is the perturbation data space somehow. And we have some perturbation data at point zero in this space and some other perturbation data at point one. And so at this point zero, we have a zero manifold of curves of given genus and homology class and so on. Um, and and it's, it's, some, it's some zero manifold, it's just a collection of points with signs. And then we start deforming the data. That means we pick a path in this, in this space of perturbation data. So over each point in this path, there is a new moduli space and we kind of see what happens as we go along. And the, and the key point is that this non-smooth curves, the nodal ones, they actually appear in co-dimension two. So to see that you can take your favorite degeneration co-dimension two, which may be the equation uh, in, in C2, where you take X times Y is equal epsilon, epsilon complex parameter. So it's a smooth curve for epsilon non-zero. For epsilon zero, it's just two, the two coordinate axes, right? So it's, it's a nodal curve. And when you want to perturb out of this nodal curve, you can turn on the epsilon parameter, which is complex and has two, two dimensions. So if in, in some other kind of neck stretching picture, the node degeneration looks like a, a S1 times R or S1 times interval where interval is getting very, very long. And this long parameter is one of the two uh, gluing parameters near the generation. And the other one is the twist along the S1. So how to join these two curves is on the one hand, there is a length and on the other hand, there is a twist. So, so that's this black dot down here. That's where we would go into a non-smooth curve and things change somehow. But we pick our blue path not to go through such curves. And then the only thing we see is some points here where the projection from the solution manifold parameterized solution manifold down to the blue manifold has critical points. So just more modification. So, so, so the count of points here is maybe is one minus one and then one, two. So it's two. And so when you go over here, it's still two. It's somehow this one dimensional space is a cobordism and the number of algebraic endpoints of a one dimensional cobordism is zero. So the number here is equal to the number over here. Um, Okay, so, so that, that's somehow the setup for Gromovitan theory from, you know, math side and, and uh, for closed curves. And of course, the reason I'm talking about it is that it's not going to be that simple for open curves in a while. But before going to open curves, I, I would like to say one more thing, uh, which is a sort of uh, appearing towards the end. Maybe by, by tomorrow, we'll see the, the open uh, counterparts of these, or at least the starting point. So that, that's that the following um, uh, observation, I should say, the following result of Gupta Kumavafa that actually these normal Witten invariants, they are not completely random, but rather you can organize them in a much nicer way so that this Gromov Witten uh, invariant of our manifold X is in fact can be written as a sum of certain BPS states or basic curves, uh, they, they will be embedded holomorphic curves from the geometric point of view, where each such curve contributes some, in, you know, you count it by some integer. And then there is a standard contribution to the gromov witten potential from that curve. And, and here I throw in some new notation. I'll explain it in a second, but basically this beta is homology class of the curve. So D times beta is uh, some curve wrapping D times around that homology class. And uh, let me go on and, 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 and draw the cartoon picture of this uh, contribution and, and explain what is the geometry here. So the basically the degree, the, the uh, term corresponding to D uh, counts whatever curves comes from a default cover of our basic curve. So here, uh, let us start with D equals one, okay? So at D equals one, so here we have a certain sphere, maybe it's the basic curve is a sphere. Uh, it would contribute here with D equals one, this is one, so we don't care. 
this is also one. So it just says that this Q to the beta is just a placeholder for the homology class of this curve. So it, it lives in the homology class, it lives, that's fine. But then somehow there is this uh, denominator, which you can think of as a power series in GS. So GS is string coupling constant. So, so it's, it's something that starts like, uh, depending on all the characteristics, it starts like one over GS, uh, GS to some power and then GS to higher, higher powers and so on. So this is somehow every second um, term in, 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 in the exponential, uh, in power series exponential. Okay. So where do they come from? So even for D equals one, we should have a lot of curves. So not, not just the sphere, but it should be higher, higher genus curves. And those uh, curves come from this sphere with constant curves attached to it. So formally we have a whole family of solutions, namely the sphere with at every point you can attach a torus or a two, two hole torus or whatever kind of curve you want. And so you have a massive amount of solutions of the quartz riemann equation. And this formula is telling us how many of those solutions are there when we perturb. And so, so, so that means that even the first term, it counts this sort of basic guy, but with all the constants attached, if we would perturb. So you, you would get exactly this many, it's infinitely many solutions, but, but exactly that many in each genus. Okay, and so when you now take D to be two or three or whatever, then there is that effect of attaching constants, but also the effect of having branch cover. So for example, here you see, a, I guess a genus two surface uh, covering the sphere. And I guess there somehow, I hope I did the count right, but some six number of quadratic branch points where, where the surface looks like, where, where the map looks like, Z goes to C squared. So this is sort of Riemann's famous space of, of surfaces. And so you have to uh, integrate or, or find some vector bundle over that space in order to count how many solutions there would be. And these two things conspire to give you this formula. Okay. And the idea behind it is that if you want to count the curves, and this is somehow the, the idea from Grupo Kumovafo is somehow maybe the fact that this, this should be, it's in some shadow of an M2 brain and some partition function in M theory. But the way that this was dealt with in, in, in math, it was somehow that, you know, you find one, one of these basic curves and by some arguments, you know exactly which curves live nearby. So this, this count is true nearby and then you extend perturbation and you get the next basic curve and the next one and so on. So somehow you expand the gromov witten invariant as a sum of local contributions to gromov witten invariant near basic curves. So this is somehow how that's supposed to work. Okay, um, so let's sort of consider the, the one very basic example that, that uh, will appear here is somehow the I mean, it's basically this formula in the simplest case. So, but, but when we have the resolved conifold, so we have a, a P1 uh, and over that P1, we have a, the, the, the generic bundle I was talking about. So it's O minus one plus O minus one. And there is one basic sphere. So if, if you somehow ask somebody, what are the embedded holomorphic curves in this space? It's obviously just the zero section of this bundle. And the gromov witten partition function is this sum uh, where you have the denominator that I was talking about to power two, because two is the only characteristic of the sphere. And then you have this homology class of the de default cover. So homology class of the sphere, we, we think of as this uh, logarithm of A squared, and you take it to power D when you go D times around. Okay, so, so but, but quite a lot is hidden in this Q here, right? So, so you would really have to expand if you want to go back to gromov witten theory, you have to expand e to the gs in, in power series of gs. <clears throat> okay, okay. Um, great. So, so this is the back. This was the background from uh, you know generalities about this topological string as a physical theory, how it localizes on holomorphic curves, 
And then you can go, if you approach this gromov witten theory from point of view of math, you start with the holomorphic curves and you have to look at, uh, instead of the path integral, you have to look at what happens when you deform the data and, and show that the count does not change and so on. And, and then there was this nice way of counting curves that come from this uh, Gupa Komarafa story. Okay, so, so now I want to move to, to open, open curves or, or open strings. So we have now again our manifold X and inside there we have a Lagrangian on which the strings are allowed to end. And just, I mean, action, everything, the path integral looks as, as before, uh, more or less. And, and so the, the, the uh, path integral still localizes and localizes on holomorphic curves. But in this case, the, the moduli space of holomorphic curves has co-dimension one boundary. And in order to understand what somehow is the difference, if, if I give again my toy example. So here, we're supposed to look at curves, say, so my previous toy example was curves in C2, it was X, Y is equal epsilon, right? And so there was just a complex curve in C2, but here we need to have real curves. So they, they should have the boundary on R2, which means that you look at the curve X times Y equals epsilon, but you require epsilon to be a real parameter. And then of course, this nodal curve has co-dimension one rather than two. You think about this stretching picture, what happens in that curve is that it's not a cylinder S1 times R that stretch, but it's an interval times R that stretches out. And so there is no twist anymore. You just have to glue them. Um, I mean, it's sort of given you glue them like this. So uh, that means that the nodal curves have co-dimension one and one cannot expect the gromov witten count that we could write up this, the way we did, right? To be really invariant. There has to be some kind of boundary term or something like that, right? So I'm going to approach this mainly from the point of view of this, this math perspective where we start by defining the space of holomorphic curves. It's a, some zero manifold. We see what happens when we deform and we see if we can make it invariant somehow. And as this example shows that, 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 you know, it won't be invariant unless you do something. So, so of course, I, I, I have some solution to this problem. Otherwise, I wouldn't give this talk. But, but, but let's just first look at what's going wrong if you, if you approach this naively. So, so here in the left-hand side, uh, I have the, the, I don't know, this is not a blackboard, but whatever kind of board it is, is supposed to be the Lagrangian. So you, you see two circles here. And I call them boundary of U and boundary of V. So imagine you have a Lagrangian, a three-dimensional Lagrangian. And in this Lagrangian, on that Lagrangian forms two holomorphic disks, let's say. And they have their boundaries. One is this DU and the other one is DV. And they link as shown in the picture. So now, if I start deforming the data, I deform, say, the complex structure. These two curves, they start to move. And at some point, you can imagine that they cross through. So one crosses through the boundary of the other, like in the picture. So what comes out at the other side? Well, of course, these two curves still come out. They, they didn't break or anything like that. They just kind of moved through each other. But when they cross, just like this x, y is equal epsilon, I can glue them and I find a new curve, which is twice as big. So if you know homology class of this disk is homology class of one plus homology class of the other. And, and so on one side of this bad moment, the crossing moment, I have two disks. And on the other side, I have three disks. And so you know, counting them naively is, is, not gonna, is not gonna help very much. And I'm not gonna have a, an invariant count of holomorphic curves. So, the point is that you somehow need to encode whatever happened between the boundaries before and after such, such um, crossings. And, and that's somehow exactly that what we are going to do and, and what, what I want to ex explain how to do. And, and before I, I, I go tell you about the actual solution to this problem, I want to mention uh, 
the two places where, where these um, ideas uh, leading up to these what's called what we call skein valued uh, uh, with invariants maybe uh, uh, comes from and that that's that comes from two results of, of Witten. and the first one is uh, uh, a relation between open topological strings in cotangent bundles and turn Simon's theory and the second one is somehow the famous interpretation of home flip polynomials uh, in terms of Wilson loops in Chern Simon's theory. So, so let me start with the first one. So here, um, from our point of view, we have we have a Lagrangian in some Calabiao. But if you have a Lagrangian anywhere in any symplectic manifold, it always has a neighborhood, which is symplectomorphic to a small neighborhood of the zero section in its cotangent bundle. So one can now look at whatever would be the, all the small open strings, small energy open strings that lives entirely in this neighborhood. And that would be the open from Witten theory in the cotangent bundle. So, so, so we, we are going to deal with that first. And in this cotangent bundle, we have now the standard symplectic form, just differential of PDQ, differential of action form. Okay, so, so here, uh, the main observation is that again, there, there are somehow there are holomorphic curves, but they are pretty boring. So if you have a holomorphic <coughs> Riemann surface supposed to be holomorphic, maps into this cotangent bundle boundary on L, then by exactness and Stokes theorem, the area of that curve is zero, and and then it is constant. So we have a moduli space, which in some in some sense we understand, right? It's the all the points in the manifold and over each point sits the whole kind of this Deline Mumford space with all, all complicated curves and it just mapped by constants. But anyway, then Witten's observation here was that he, he wanted to relate the open, open string theory in cotangent bundle to Chern Simon's theory. And he did it in, in a way that maybe uh, uh, is a little bit non-standard, but anyway, he's using what, what he calls string field theory. So inventing some field theory on the space of maps of our Riemann surfaces into, or, or, or actually of maps of, of, of strings into this, um, into this uh, cotangent bundle or whatever ambient space. And then because all the maps are constants, he shows that this theory basically reduces on the level of, of of the action and path integral into what's called Chern Simon's theory. So in his treatment, this A here would be a field on the space of all maps, but as all, all maps are constants, it sort of reduces to a field on the, the values of the maps, which are the, are the which, which is the manifold L itself. <clears throat> and, and, and more than that, the, Turn Simon's partition function is equal to this open string partition function, he argues. And the Chern Simon's partition function is this Chern Simon's action uh, that hopefully you've seen before. Uh, and you take the path into an exponentially the version of that. So this thing is not quite gauge invariant, but it changes by integer multiple, integer multiples of, I guess, eight pi squared, some second Chern class somewhere, um, and therefore this expression here in the exponential is, is, is gauge invariant, and one expands this in uh, powers of uh, one over k, which is called the level of Schoen Simon's theory. Okay, but the, that's, the detail is not so important. What uh, Witten argued then was somehow that the Chern Simon's uh, theory with n, uh, with gauge group UN is the same as the gromov witten theory uh, in T star of the manifold with N, N copies of the uh, Lagrangian boundary condition on the zero section. And there is this identification of parameters where the string coupling is, is uh, basically one over K, but shifted by N, uh, it's a famous shift. <clears throat> but one can somehow, uh, intuitively believe this um, th 
thing by looking at the perturbation theory of the, of the, the Feynman uh, perturbation theory of, of, the, of the open string and now of the churn Simons and identifying fat graphs with surfaces. But maybe let me skip over that uh, in order to get to the main points of what I want to say today. So the second input uh, of this Witten, um, Witten study was that, so if you have a knot inside your three manifolds, so here I take the manifold to be S3, so that's what we'll use mainly. Then uh, you can insert it as a Wilson loop in this churn simons theory, and, and you can take the expectation value of, so that would be the trace of the holonomy of the connection around the knot, right? So that's some kind of expectation value. And, and Witten's famous result says that, well, that expectation value is in fact the home free polynomial. And what, uh, for, for you and, for you and uh, gauge theory. So what that would mean is the following, that if you have a knot in S3 and you pick up a little sphere somewhere uh, where this knot looks like uh, L should be K here, K plus, the overcrossing k minus undercrossing and k zero is the split splitting so that maybe it's a link but anyway then it's saying that the expectation value of the three different nodes or links are related by this so-called skein relation so the the proof that Witten gave of this result is very non-perturbative in nature so he basically expressed this path integral as, <clears throat> as some, you know, he splits the manifold over this four punctured sphere. And the four punctured sphere has a Hilbert space, which is two dimensional. So when you take the inside and the outside and glue them, you need to find a linear relation between these three. And this is the linear relation as you verify by basically concrete calculation. So, um, so, so this is some kind of important uh, for us later, um, usage of, 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 of churn simons theory that we actually, in sort of non-perturbative treatment, uh, we can calculate Wilson loops in a very easy way by this gain relation. So in this, this unknot has this value and it's taken normally in, in, in this um, uh, subject as just uh, normalization. Some people normalize it to one or instead, but we, we'll see that this actually arises naturally from from uh, holomorphic curve counting. Okay, so um, the maybe the last. Let's see if I um, see. Uh, so yeah, so so let, let me let me go on. So so we would like to also include somehow these notes in curve counting, and uh, and then uh, what we are doing is we are actually associating a Lagrangian to a knot. And what is that Lagrangian? Well, that's the Lagrangian co-normal of the knot. So topologically, if the, the knot sits in S3, let's say, and then you take the Lagrangian subvariety of T star S3, which is the, the knot times all the fiber vectors which are perpendicular to the knot. So the, the knot is an S1, and at each point there sits an R2 of vectors perpendicular to it. And, and then uh, we can do the open string partition function uh, for, for the holomorphic curves or strings stretching between LK and, and, and the zero section S3. And uh, maybe I'll do the a long, make a long story uh, shorter and just state the result that counting such objects, it's not so hard just arguing by insertion in this path integral to see that the sum of those is actually the colored, symmetrically colored Homflip polynomials of K. So that means if we go back that, you know, in this formula for the, for K, we took the trace in the basic representation here, but we could take the trace in the nth symmetric representation or K symmetric representation instead and then that would be the colored Homfleet polynomial. And so <clears throat> what we're saying is that 
open strings between one copy of LK and many copies of this S3 is exactly given by the color conflict. Okay. Uh, very good. So uh, to get to the open curve counting, we are going to use also the last suggestion by, by Witten. And uh, he's, he was studying here the less local situation. So now we had L, it sits in T star L and we count open strings and we get exactly Chern Simon's theory somehow. And now we take L and we put it inside X where X is more complicated. So there could in principle form some holomorphic curve with boundary on L where that holomorphic curve is non-constant, okay? So then Witten suggests that the open string <clears throat> should be, basically there should be an effective field theory for the open string, which inserts all the multiples of this, uh, of the, of the Wilson loop along the boundary of this holomorphic curve weighted by the area okay, and the Euler characteristic. So this is somehow the suggestion that when L is not in the purely local situation, you should get some sort of churn simons theory deformed by the holomorphic curves ending on L. Okay? And, and that's a great suggestion and we'll actually, we'll actually follow it and use it. But let's first observe that there is something wrong with this suggestion because the idea is that this, this should be invariant, right? You're doing topological strings, so it should be invariant under deformations. And so if you start from say this, actually take this left-hand side picture pretty seriously. So we have a holomorphic disc ending on Lagrange. You start deforming the Lagrange. Then the boundary of the holomorphic disc can shrink and shrink and shrink until it becomes a point and the curve leaves the Lagrange. And, and whatever happens after that moment, there is, no, there, is, there is no Wilson loop at all here. Right? And so, so this, this suggestion cannot be quite true. It's somehow, it, it won't be deformation invariant if, if you know, boundaries shrink away. And in some sense, what, what um, a, an important piece of this thing that we are going to, that I'm going to tell you about is to add an appropriate term. I mean, I don't know the exact interpretation in this language, but it's to add some term making this thing invariant so, so that when you shift off, you still remember uh, that you should be contributing to the open string, uh, even, even though you have no boundary on that. Okay. Uh, so let me now tell you about this solution to defining, uh, to defining uh, curve counts for uh, op open curves that are actually invariant. So, Again, the starting point is the same. We have a zero dimensional modulized space, but the problem is that in this space, we have these co-dimension one walls. And the idea is to cancel the various uh, crossings with this wall in order to get um, an invariant count. And in general, we will count, this will force us to count in the, what's called the Humphrey skein and for curves which, which are invariant under some involution, we will have used the Kaufman skein, but the Kaufman skein will be used mainly as an illustration of one thing. So the Homfrey skein will be my main, main case. So, so let me tell you first, what is the skein module of a three manifold? And, uh, and I will concentrate mainly on this left-hand side. So the skein module is a module over a ring in two variables, I call them A and Z, and the kind of Loren, Loren polynomial ring, and, and the Z will be related to our previous Q eventually, and the A will be the homology, uh, a homology variable when we do some 24 transition. Okay, so the Homfrey skein postulates that if I have, uh, and, and, and we're now working with framed, framed links, so you should think of a little band so that actually my pictures here, uh, you can give blackboard framing in this, this picture if you want. But anyway, so, so the, the frame skein has this three relations. So one is the fact that overcrossing minus undercrossing is Z 
times the splitting. The second one is that the unknot has value a minus a inverse over z, or you write it in this way, that equivalent. And finally, somehow this price for framing that if you have, you change the framing, you have a kink in your diagram and you remove it, that costs A. And uh, if you remove a negative crossing, it costs A inverse. For the Kaufman, in the Kaufman world, there are similar relations, but you have unoriented uh, diagrams and a little bit more terms. So, but let, let me not go into that now. Let me stay with the whole thing. So this scan module, uh, is first, so what does this mean? So it means I take all isotopy classes of oriented frame links and I divide by these relations that in a small ball, I can change overcrossing to undercrossing at the price of adding Z times splitting. So this is some initially huge module, but for example, in S3, it's a very small module. It's actually just this ground ring. So you see that if you have a very complicated knot diagram, you can change a crossing and simplify. You can reduce the number of crossings until you come down to just unknots. So basically, you start from anything and you end with a polynomial times unknots, which by this relation is just a polynomial. So, so in fact, the Homfley skein module is just just the, mo the module of polynomials. In other manifolds, it's more complicated. Like for S1 times R2, you have a basis which contains of uh, uh, contains curves that go m times around or backwards or forwards, and then you can multiply those by by such uh, polynomials. Um, but anyway, so for S three it's very simple. For S one times R three or two, it's uh, infinitely generated, but somehow it's one one polynomial for each number of times around. Okay, so the the skeins on brains approach is to count, not in some sense all curves, but to count what's called bare curves, what we call bare curves. So those are curves without these constants attached. So it means it's a curve for which all its components have positive symplectic area. So the idea is this skeins on brains counting is basically like the first step in the Gupta Kumavafa formula. So don't perturb constants, keep them, but perturb everything else. And, uh, and, and we call such curves bare, and uh, it's a tricky business to count them. I'll explain how it goes and why it works. Um, but it's sort of not exactly the standard treatment in gromo witten theory. Um, okay, so that, that's, that's the bare curves, uh, but then there is this other term that's needed in order to fix this problem, the little green thing in the, in the effective action. And so uh, what we do is we take on our Lagrangian, it's a three manifold, we take a vector field, uh, right here generic, it's enough, but let's take a non-zero vector field. Um, and then we take a four chain, so it's a chain in the ambient space, which has boundary twice L. So it would seem to require that L is homologous, homologous to zero, but we actually take a four chain in some kind of, we allow non-compact such things. So in, in, in T star of L, for example, we could just take a vector field and take the graph both ways. We have a non-compact chain and that's good enough for us. We take such a chain and we require that it starts out like J times this vector field everywhere in the manifold. So somehow vector field lies along the manifold, you multiply by J, it goes out. Okay. And now if we have a holomorphic curve, so we're gonna use it to define a certain linking number. We have a holomorphic curve with boundary on L, <clears throat> which is nowhere tangent to Xi, which it generically won't be. Then Xi and the tangent vector of this curve determines another vector, which is the normal to that plane. And we shift the curve off of that normal, j times that normal a little bit near the boundary. So what we find then is the boundary of this new curve is off of the four chain, right? Because the four chain sits out in j times xi, and we are in direction j times nu, which is perpendicular. So they're disjoint, and we can call, we can take the linking number between L and the holomorphic map u 
by counting intersections of this shifted version of U and the four chain C. So that's just some number, okay? So with that, we can now define the skein valued curve count as the sum of all holomorphic curves disconnected. And how do we count them? Well, we count them by their weight. So this is just a manifold. Maybe sometimes it's a third, a fourth, whatever. It's just plus minus one, typically, if it would be a manifold. Then it's Z variable to the Euler characteristic of our map. And then the A variable in the Homfli, uh, in the Homfli scheme to this linking number I just defined. And finally, the boundary of the curve framed by this new vector in the frame scheme. So this is an element in the scheme module of L, okay? And what I want to argue now is that this count of open curves, even though we have these wall crossings, is actually uh, invariant. And uh, maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll skip these technicalities for how you actually set this up, but, but let, me, let me give you the main, uh, the main points in, in this. Uh, okay, so, so we, we have to set up some perturbation schemes so that uh, curves uh, are now form a zero manifold. Uh, that's not uh, super difficult, but um, uh, the main point is this thing that, you know, what would be really bad for us is this scenario down here in two. You start with a bare curve. So that's the one on the left here. You start with a bare curve. It's a it's a, it's a torus with one boundary component. <clears throat> and then you deform your data. We, we try to do this one parameter family business. And what can happen perhaps is that as you deform your curve limits to just a disk with a constant punctured torus attached, right? So a bare curve could possibly limit to a non-bare curve. And you would like to count bare curves and say that something is invariant. So that would be a complete disaster. But what you can show here is that such things, if some interesting topology falls down into a zero area component, that actually happens in co-dimension at least two. And what is the reason? Well, the reason is that as you limit to such a curve, when you zoom in near this point, you actually find that the derivative of the, of the uh, map, the complex derivative of the map has to be zero at the point of bubbling. It's somehow after zooming in, it's some riemann hurwitz count. And, and, and that was somehow avoided because any such thing counts called dimension two uh, at least. And, and so therefore you can actually avoid if you set this up perturbation scheme up in the right way, not perturbing constant, you can avoid this bubbling. So we have a nice manifold, no bubbles disappear. So that's bare curves make sense. And then we have to look at what happens in one parameter families. And, and somehow the main uh, take home message here is that what happens in one parameter families are exactly the skein relation. So if you never learn anything about knot theory, and you just went and studied open gromer witten theory for bare curves, you would learn there is a skein relation. And, 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 and we learn it as follows. So what, are, what do we see here? Well, we see, a, we see a curve that is about to cross. It crosses and goes through. So that's one moduli space of curves of, of some Euler characteristic. But at this crossing moment, as I said, you can glue the branches and you give rise to a new moduli space, which uh, has Euler characteristic one less, right? So you get them by adding a little band between the two branches and, and the curve starts out as this split thing. So if I impose this condition on my count of curves, then the jump as I cross the wall here, which is this jump, is exactly compensated by the, um, the new curve. So if I impose the skein relation, my curve will be invariant. 
let's look at the normalization or these other, other things. So what can also happen? The only other thing that can happen in one parameter family is that a curve, it is a two dimensional object moving in six dimensional space could at an isolated point here in the middle L intersect the three manifold, right? The, the L. And then uh, you see, uh, we were measuring linking between the curve and L. And here the linking number has kind of plus one contribution, so that's the A. And here it's minus one contribution, that's the A inverse. But as I cross, I can also open up the, the intersection point and a new little boundary is born. Euler characteristic goes down with one and I have an unknot at the boundary. So if I impose the condition that A minus A inverse is equal to Z times unknot, then my, my, my count remains invariant. And so, so somehow you discover by imposing invariant, invariance on this open Gromovitian count of, of bare curves that if you count in the scale, you're invariant. Okay, so here is a, a similar story for, for uh, when you have an involution, but let me again skip it. It's, uh, it's exactly more or less the same, uh, keeping track of that. So, so I, I want to also mention this last point, um, and the last point says that, you know, you, we, we use this boundary, we pick up the framing by looking at how the tangent twists with respect to psi. So basically we give it the framing by tangent and mu. And so in, in one parameter families, of course, it could be that at this point, it is exactly tangent to psi, right? That, that can happen. So the, the psi is pointing out of the blackboard in this picture. And then we have to see what happens. So at that point, you know, the boundary is tangent to psi, but the curve is holomorphic. So the whole curve here at that point is tangent to the four chain. So when I push on, I see a newborn intersection between the four chain and the curve. This mark C here. So you see that this kinking, the thing with the kink should be equal to four chain intersection plus the thing without the kink. That's exactly this frame relation once you check the intersection sign. So, <clears throat> so somehow four chain plus bare curves teaches you the frame scan relation. And you do now have an invariant count. Um, okay, so um, the plan was to go a little bit further than what, what I, I, I did, but uh, let me maybe make a few comments on this counting procedure. So, so we have a nice invariant count. Um, what is the difference between this count and the usual perturbative treatment? Well, this count is inductive in Euler characteristics. So somehow you go further down, but the usual perturbative treatment is not. And the reason is that if you, you know, you start with a positive area curve and you meet with a zero area uh, annulus and the positive area curve like that. Then when I want to forget the point, this guy becomes unstable and should, should not appear. Gromo Witten theory is about stable map. So you cannot have zero area and unstable domain. So somehow it's a little bit different. And, um, and the next observation is that the way we treat the curves is that by this C variable, we treat them exactly like the first variable, first step in this Gupta Kumarafa formula, like not the multi-cover, but the single cover with all the constants attached. And that's indeed the, the way that they will appear in standard Roman written theory. If you, appear, if you apply it in the closed curve case, for example. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I think I'll stop at this and I'll show you the next time how this uh, bare curve counting uh, leads to a proof of this large M duality. And uh, from there, I will take you to uh, hopefully what would be somehow this BPS version uh, of Gromovitan theory in the open case. Okay, but I'll stop at this now. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Tobias. Are there any questions? See one, yes. Uh, I'm gonna start with Nikita. 
I was just I was just applauding. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Was, was that an applause as well? That's a, that's a fair question. I think. <laughs> other questions other than applauses for statements of appreciation. I think I have a quick question about the appearance of the Kofman's <clears throat> scape. <clears throat> so it, um, it, I, I seem to understand that this was required when he introduced this extra regulator, the, this intersection terms of the four chain with the, uh, wow. with the image of the curve. Um, but it, it, is it something that's strictly required when you only consider oriented curves? Or is it something yeah. extra when, when you have stuff that's fixed under some involution? Yeah, so, so, so let me maybe, uh... Uh, let me say uh, two words about this. So the point here is that if you look at these pictures on the right, so so you have a you have some involution now. Your Lagrangian is fixed under the involution, so it's basically you can double every curve you see. It has two halves, right? And then uh, when you go through this crossing moment, uh, you have a friend of it, which is this resolution and that resolution, and and the the Kaufman's skein tells you that these uh, Euler characteristic, let's say, K curves should be related to the Euler characteristic K plus one curves in this way by the skein. And there is a somehow counterpart, elliptic counterpart. But the standard Gromma Witten theory would not relate them at all. You would say that, okay, I'm not, I don't care. I have a nice moduli space here. I have a nice moduli space here, and I just count. And I count them one and I count them one. And, um, and that's okay, that's a theory that works. But if I skip ahead a little bit in time uh, to where I was going. So here is a future, look into the future. Okay, <laughs> so, so, so uh, we will show that if you take uh, the not cone normal, shift it off a little bit inside T star S3, you, you basically find one annulus there and it's counted by its value in the scheme. okay? You can stretch and do some business and so on. But in, in the case of real curves or for Kaufman's scheme, you can actually compare. So for real curves, as I indicated, there is an ordinary gromma witten theory. And for real curves, the count, if you do it, the not skeins on brains way without the four chain is one for every knot. It's just one. Whereas if you count it with the four chain, you would get the Kaufman polynomial for the knot. So it's somehow, as, as I mentioned here, it's like comparing counting curves in the complement of the zero section to comparing them in the union. And it's sort of some relative count. And of course, you, it's hard to count in the complement because the curves are not in the complements. So you have to get the out to shift them all. But, but it's really kind of quite, quite a drastic, uh, refinement uh, to, and, and, and the key is that in ordinary gromma witten theory, I'm flipping back. So in ordinary gromma witten theory, you would never really have the curves of genus one less or all the characteristic one less talk to those of one more. It's just one story separately. And, and, and then it looks like it's one, but somehow here it's a little bit more refined. So that, that's a, also a great question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ronnie? Um, yes, yeah, so um, you, you made a couple of choices in this construction, uh, uh, taking this vector field and then the four chain. And, right. uh, how much does this construction depend on the choices? Uh, not so much. So if I, if I say it a little bit carelessly, it would be like more or less framing change, right? So. The, the A changes and the X may change by X times A or something like that. So it's, it's basically changes like that. So, so it, it's, it's not completely independent, but fairly independent. So. Okay, but you, you can explicitly describe how this sure. works. Yeah, you, you, yeah okay. you, can, you can. Thanks. Yeah, I guess we should probably postpone questions maybe to the end of talk tomorrow. Uh, unless maybe not, maybe there's, a, there's time for a quick question if someone has. Let me check. Tom Richard. Yeah, maybe I can start asking silly questions just um, because we should have 
everyone asking as many questions as possible, I guess. But I was just asking, wondering about what would be the kind of B model version of this and have people studied this where I guess that would be a holomorphic vector model, right? And, uh... Yeah, I, I, I mean, the short answer is I don't, I don't know until further down the story. So, so somehow uh, we will create, uh, um, so say for not conormal, there, there will be a, a curve uh, where, where you actually get some geometric way of finding this, what, you know, called sometimes a, a polynomial or quantum curve or something like that. And the B model would be the B model of that one. And, and so it should be the, we're finding some counterpart of Donaldson Thomas theory, but not that I know exactly how, how the change of variables go, right? But, but there will be a B model. And, and I don't know in some sense, I think in some sense, uh, there won't, uh, maybe the B model didn't change very much. So the, 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 one of the problems before was that for the open case, case of open curves, there was not a very good A model because mm -hmm. of <laughs> the, the naive goal from a written invariant is not invariant at all, right? So, so you need to do something with it. And, and this scan value thing is basically what we found. And in the end, I think that when I come to what one would like to, to, to find it, it's more or less like finding boundary conditions in DT theory. And I don't really know what that's on the other side. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a little bit um, bits and pieces of this story make full sense in going to be model and, but 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 in general i i don't really know in some sense it's, uh, uh, mm -hmm. okay thank you thanks. okay uh if there are no more questions uh we can thank tobias again mm -hmm. And yeah, we're resuming five minutes uh, for Tony Yu's talk. Thank you.